First of all, I should probably introduce um, our very esteemed panel that we're lucky to have today. So um, here we have Jen Kalea. Many of you may know Jen from um, other translation <coughs> events. She's, she's um, become something of a notorious person in translation, <laughs> in, in the best possible way. Um, Jen is a writer and literary translator from German. She was the inaugural translator in residence at the British Library in 2017 and is going to continue to do um, some work with them over the next year, I believe. She's translated fiction and non-fiction for Bloomsbury, Faber and Faber, Fitzcarraldo Editions, and Pyrene Press. She writes a column on literary translation for The Quietus, is founding editor of the Anglo-German arts journal The Freundum's Effect, and was acting editor of New Books in German for two years. She was also previously translator in residence at the Austrian Cultural Forum in London, which uh, was the first time I had to work with, the first time I had the opportunity to work with Jen on <laughs> exciting uh, translation projects. Jen is also working on translating poetry at the moment. Um, then we have Teodora Danik, um, who I also first encountered at the Austrian Cultural Forum. Uh, Te Teodora um, is writer, writer in translation program manager at English Pen, where she works to promote and facilitate the translation of literature from around the world. She also edits Pen Transmissions, which is a, a fantastic new online zine for international writing. It's all beautiful and has really uh, wonderful contributors. I really recommend you look it up if you haven't already. Uh, Theodora previously worked at New Books in German as well, uh, and, um, and at the Technisches Museum in Vienna. Um, Kate Griffin here on the end. Kate is Associate Programme Director at the National Centre for Writing in Norwich with a particular focus on international literature and translation. Um, she was formerly International Programme Director at the British Centre for Literary Translation and has developed projects in the Middle East, the Far East, Asia and Europe. And you can find uh, more about her work on her blog, kategriffin.org. Charlotte Ryland, um, who I first met aged 18 when she taught me Bertolt Brecht at UCL, um, is dedicated to promoting language learning and literary translation. Most notably, she's recently become director of the Stephen Spender Trust and is also the editor of New Books in German. She lives in Oxford and is currently setting up a translation outreach hub at Queen's College, Oxford, to engage young people of all ages in literary translation. Um, and connected to, to that last point is um, Jennifer Higgins, who's uh, oh, sorry, here in the middle, um, from Queen's College, Oxford, who's a translator from French and Italian, She's currently working on a co-translation with Sophie Lewis of Une Renard Amenue uh, by the contemporary French writer Emmanuel um, Pagano to be published in 2019 by Pyrene Press and is um, setting up and running with Charlotte the new translation outreach hub um, at Queen's College Oxford and will be telling us about that. So um, who should we start with? Jen. <laughs> I'd like to tell us about, oh yes, and all of these people are innovators in different ways, <laughs> and that is what they're going to be talking to us about today. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now I have to justify being innovative. Um, yeah. So, fun, um, I'm fundamentally a, a practitioner in writing and translation, so I'm a, a poet and a short story writer, and currently writing a novel, but as Rebecca mentioned, I'm a literary translator, predominantly of prose, and I'm working on my first uh, translation of a collection of poetry. Um, and I've always been very much interested in, in the meeting point between writing and literary translation. Um, I mean, to me, they're exactly the same thing. And I think across everything I do in terms of workshops and residencies and my own work um, really focuses on intersemiotic translation and intralingual translation as that space where writers and translators can meet. So um, in the residencies I've done at the Austrian Cultural Forum and at the British Library, I've um, focused on uh, the power of intersemiotic translation. So at the Austrian Cultural Forum, I did an exhibition that was an exploded translation where we took a short story that I translated into English from Austrian German, and then I commissioned practitioners including Rebecca to translate that story into ceramics and tattoo flash and recipes and film and music um, to really break open what is happening in terms of a, per a, a singular voice that is then transforming something that they have digested whether it's text or image etc 
Um, and during my residency at the British Library, on a more general level, I programmed events that focused on uh, multilingual poetry and poets that are also interested in translation. Um, I've recently, in the last year or so, been developing workshops um, at the British Library, um, but also at the Poetry School, which are called Creative Translation for Writers and Translators. So again, I, I've given dedicated workshops for writers and for translators, but I like bringing them together and again looking at tasks such as translating an English poem into an English poem or translating uh, music or photography into into text um, just to bring everyone on the same level and there are so many similarities between the two disciplines such as show don't tell and you know explore what is translation what is description etc um, in terms of my current projects related to intersemiotic translation I'm translating a photo book um, which is a catalogue of the video work The Clock by Christian Marclay which is currently under the Tate Modern um, and in December I'll be doing a live performance at the Tate Modern where I'll be translating his video work while also translating um, viewers' responses to that video work. So I think um, I'm just interested in turning stuff into new stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah, my name's Kate Griffin. I'm Associate Programme Director at National Centre for Writing in Norwich, which used to be until June the 18th, um, Writer Centre Norwich. Um, when Fiona asked me to talk about uh, our work with poetry translation, I realised that we don't, at the moment, um, have projects that focus only on poetry translation. But really, translation of poetry is integrated into a number of the other initiatives that we run. So I thought what I'd talk about um, very briefly is yeah, um, what we do at the National Centre for Writing in the translation field. Um, we're looking at how we, this is Dragon Hall, where we're based. Um, it's a medieval trading hall um, with a couple of new wings. Um, we're looking at how we expand our programme um, and so part of the reason I wanted to come along here was really to listen to everybody else and hear about the other poetry translation initiatives that are taking place as we consider the role of the National Centre for Writing within that wider translation landscape. Um, we have three aims, so I'm just going to kind of outline the projects under those three aims, um, and they are art, learning and place. Um, the first one is art. Um, it's a series of programmes for, um, that basically look to bring together literary translators and publishers um, to expand the range of literature available in English um, for UK audiences. Um, we're a member of the Consortium for the Literary Translation Centre. Um, we also uh, have an Emerging Translators Mentoring Scheme, um, which covers both prose and poetry. Some of the mentees are poets. Um, Sasha Dugdale one year ran a mentorship specifically for poetry translation and we hope to do that again in the future. Um, we also have, uh, are the publisher for the journal In Other Words. Um, there are a couple of copies in the other room if anyone would like to see that. Um, that's about trans the craft of translation generally. Um, and these are a series of Japanese chapbooks um, that are called Keshki that we published with Strangers Press. Strangers Press is the, the international and translation imprint of a new publisher at the University of East Anglia, um, the UEA Publishing Project, and we're working with them on this particular imprint. So far we've only done prose, but we hope to expand to um, poetry in the future. It's a series of chapbooks. So that was about learning. Um, a number of initiatives under this. Uh, mostly in partnership with other organisations. Um, we work very closely with the British Centre for Literary Translation up at UEA, um, co-programming their summer school. Um, Fiona runs, has been running the multilingual poetry workshop as part of that. And there's also a strand um, training of trainers where uh, 
translators from other countries who are interested in developing their own translation training in their country come and observe the summer school. And I think two out of three of the tr people who came along for that strand this year were um, very interested in poetry translation. Um, we're also talking about doing a younger version, uh, kind of a summer camp, with the uh, Stephen Spender Trust and BCLT, which would be wonderful if we can pull that one off. Um, we've been running a number of international workshops and seminars, both in the UK and elsewhere, that are, again, are a mix of prose and poetry. Um, and I wanted to particularly mention um, a partnership that we have in Singapore um, to run a translator's lab, which has been a kind of a mix of the face-to-face the -face workshops that we've been doing at the BCLT summer school with the writers there, but kind of combining that with a longer online course. And that was translating from Tamil, Chinese, and Malay into English. And again, it was a mixture of prose and poetry so that the participants would have a wide range of experience. And the final one is place. Um, Norwich is a UNESCO city of literature, has been since May 2012. And so a lot of our international literary exchange projects are looking at place. Um, and so a few that I wanted to mention. Uh, one is the International Literature Showcase, which we've been running every two years with the British Council. Um, showcasing contemporary British writing, both prose and poetry, for travel opportunities and translation. Um, and we bring a number of international delegates to Norwich for um, a, a week-long event. Um, and we've been bringing delegates such as the Ajar Poetry Festival from Vietnam. Um, there's also an online version with website profiles for poets and for poetry organisations based in the UK, including modern poetry and translation and literature across frontiers. Um, and we're about to start another <coughs> program of that. Um, this photo is taken from a, an 18-month exchange called Writing Places um, that was funded by the Arts Council and British Council as part of their Reimagine India. Um, program um, celebrating the 70 years of independence. And so um, it was basically an exchange bringing um, UK poets and um, prose writers to Calcutta and Indian poets and prose writers to Norwich. Um, there are a number of uh, festival events, um, commissions, and um, we've got a publication coming out with Seagull Books next year. Um, there's also an online course that we've been running for students. Um, and this also included a translation workshop at Jadavpur University, um, translating the UK poet Tiffany Atkinson into Bengali with her there, um, working with them. So that's one, I mean, it would be great to be able to do more of those kind of long-term, really in-depth literary exchanges where you can um, incorporate both the training of translators and publication opportunities. Um, we've worked with Cove Park in Scotland, the International Artist Residency, to run a translation week for emerging translators. Um, that was open to translators of poetry as well as prose. Again, that's something that we hope to do every two years with them, so probably this time next year. And the final thing I wanted to mention is um, in the, the renovated Dragon Hall, we now have a cottage for residences, so we're able to welcome writers and translators there, um, including uh, our resident poet, um, John Ray Choi, is here with us today from South Korea. She's with us for three months till the end of November, um, and is busy writing and translating while she's here and uh, meeting lots of poets. Um, so as I said, Basically, you know, the message for me is we're doing some things, we could do more with poetry translation, and that's something that I hope to explore as a result of listening to what everybody else is doing. Thank you. Um, I'm now very, very going to briefly talk about the project I work on and why it's innovative so that I don't have the last word um, in, this, in this, which wouldn't be very gracious. Um, so um, I work, I should have last time, no. Um, the, the Poetry Ace Project, um, it's a very innovative research project in the sense that it is bridging um, public and academic worlds um, as part of its research. So we've both conducted um, practice-based workshops, which we have recorded and then documented and then um, coded qualitatively and quantitatively to, to gain 
um, sort of statistical data about how people are working and about the method that we're using. Um, and then we've also been translating that into publication practices through um, journals, through making links with uh, publishers, and through events like this to bring people around, uh, bring people into the conversation about uh, translation practice so it doesn't just become um, siloed in our, in our research project. And um, it's been quite a challenge, really, sort of speaking to different audiences, um, both at a major sort of international conference in, uh, in Hong Kong that we were at in July, and then again, sort of adjusting the kind of discourse um, to speak to people who are working in poetry in, tran in translation, who are practicing it, but are not necessarily researching it. Because I don't know how many of you are familiar with translation studies, but as a discipline, it has a whole world of, of language and terminology that is, is really distinctive um, and isn't necessarily always connected up to people who are actually working in the, in the practice or in, in the kind of the events and, uh, and the event side of things. So one of our biggest challenges as, we, as we've been working is to kind of, uh, is to bridge that. Um, <laughs> gap. Um, and so poet to poet translation to very brief, briefly summarize, um, for those of you who went at the workshop this morning, is when you have a, a poet in a source language working with a poet in a target language, and then you have a highly skilled language advisor who mediates and facilitates a conversation between the two. Um, this obviously has a great potential for, for when um, a poet is keen to, to work with another poet and translate their work, but doesn't necessarily have the complete set of, of language skills. Um, but it doesn't, but, it, but because it's a, it's a sort of uh, a present embodied sort of collaboration, uh, the boundaries between all the different roles get, get sort of blurred and skills get shared. People go beyond their inherent skill set and sort of think into this other space of collaboration, which is slightly different to poetic practice and slightly different to pure translation practice. And so we're looking at the sort of creative happenings that arise in that space of collaboration and trying to, to sort of work out how that's distinctive and what the kind of benefits of, of, of that are um, and, and how it might shape um, you know, future translation practices. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the true test of, of whether that kind of process works is you know, whether it, it makes a great translation and whether, whether it's going to you know, stand up to scrutiny in a publication uh, situation or indeed in a reading situation. Um, some, so we'll have some readings later, <laughs> so you can make up your own minds about that. Um, and yes, yeah, so that, that's, that, that's it for, for me, really. Um, so to carry on with the rest of our panel, um, Charlotte, would you like to go yeah. next? I've got uh, ah. the uh, yeah. Um, so I, um, since April, have been director of the Stevens Vendor Trust, and that's the main thing that I'm going to talk about now, and, and specifically the education part of the Stevens Vendor Trust. Um, the trust, for those that don't know it, was um, founded, I believe, 20 years ago. I think it is actually the 20-year anniversary this year. Um, hooray! And uh, it's it's developed over the years a mission to promote literary translation, international literature, and to open spaces for marginalised voices, all in the spirit of the writer and cultural activist Stephen Spender. Um, and it does this, it sort of fulfills this mission in two ways. Firstly, by having a prize for poetry um, translation, maybe? Yeah. Um, a prize for poetry and translation, and secondly, for education programmes, which are broadly um, collected under the name Translators in Schools, that you might have heard of. Um, so, no, can we go back to the prize? Sorry, yeah. So uh, the, the prize, for those that aren't familiar with it, is um, I think one of the really nice things about it is that it's extremely simple and it's extremely accessible and inclusive, theoretically, anyway. It, it, the, the idea is that you translate anybody who currently, who's a UK citizen or resident, although we're looking to expand. Um, but currently, uh, UK citizens and residents um, can translate any poem out of any language, ancient or modern, into English. There is a limit of how long it can be because apparently in the early days people 
are submitting sort of whole books. So, uh, so it's a 60 line limit now. And you write a 300 word commentary um, that does not need to be at all kind of um, academic or, um, or too, um, too complex, but is really just a, um, a, an explanation of how you made your decisions and how you chose the poem, perhaps, and kind of just a way of giving a sense of what, you, what, uh, of what the translation meant to you. Um, and we have youth categories. Um, so there's four, currently 14 and under and 18 and under. Um, and then 18 and over, uh, so I guess 19 and over is the open category, and that's everybody. Um, and we have uh, cash prizes, awards, um, which are happening in November um, in central London. And then all the winners are published <coughs> in a booklet and online on our website. Um, we also currently have some resources for teachers, um, which is part of the drive that's happened in recent years to try and make this more, even more accessible, um, in particular to teachers and pupils in the state sector, but I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and also as part of that drive, this year for the first time we're having a, an extra strand of the prize called the Polish Spotlight, which is exactly the same idea, except for it's only for translation out of Polish into English, and it's only youth, so it's 18 and under. And the deadline for that is tomorrow. So if you know any 18 and under, who, uh, and so the idea of that, and, and again, I'll talk about this a bit when I talk about our workshops, is that you don't have to know Polish to do a good prize-worthy translation. We have resources on our website that are kind of worksho worksheets that take you through the process of translating a poem and give you give you um, either glossaries or um, literal translations so that you can still engage in this creative activity even if you don't know Polish or you might get your Polish friend to kind of do a literal translation and all of that is fine. Um, the idea is that it's as accessible as possible and we want as many people as possible to engage in this activity which we all know is so enriching. Uh, okay. So Translators in Schools grew, grew out of the prize. The prize uh, was founded in 2004, and um, in 2010, the first um, education program um, of the Stephen Spender Trust was launched, which is called Translation Nation. Um, and the, um, the basic idea there was that it, um, the trust uh, trained translators to go into super diverse, I believe they're called, uh, um, communities, in, um, in this case in East London, and to run um, two days of translation workshops. And what they were translating was folk tales or stories from the primary pupils' um, home community heritage languages. So, so basically stories that they brought in from home, which um, were then workshopped in a group and then performed, and then all the pupils voted on which was the best one. So you've got your kind of um, X factor thing in there as well. Um, and that ran for a few years to great success. It was also extended into secondary school where they worked, where they worked mainly on translating film subtitles. Um, and then out of that grew this program, which is now, as I said, the kind of umbrella term for everything that we do, translators in schools. But that initially was just a professional development program for translators, because what was found with Translation Nation was that it had this amazing impact, which I'm also going to talk about in a minute. But there weren't enough translators trained in these skills to do this work. So translators in schools is mainly about training translators, and we continue to do that. Um, and. Thirdly, um, to, uh, a, yeah, a third kind of program of the trust is known as the Big Translate, and that is um, a, it's partly about collaborative translation, it's partly about pu pub a public translation event, so a group of um, pr usually primary pupils are brought together, this has happened in the South Bank Centre for example, um, and they in groups spend the day translating something. Um, usually a picture book, but it can also work with poetry. Um, and they're taken through this process, which, um, as I have said, doesn't require them to know the language at, at the outset. It requires somebody, <laughs> the facilitator, to know the language that's, um, um, that's being translated, but, but none of the young people need to know it. And then um, at the end of the day, they again perform. Um, and there's an invited audience, which can include parents and teachers, but also um, uh, other interested people and 
if it's somewhere like the South Bank, then also kind of passing traffic are encouraged to come and ex uh, come and experience it. And so it's also a way of kind of showing people who might not be immediate, immediately aware of what the wonders of translation. Um, it can open that up to them. Um, could we look at the next slide? Yeah. So. So it's really in university context, I thought I'd use the word impact, because that's uh, <laughs> very important. Um, and these are three, four, four quotes that I picked out from um, feedback over the past couple of years. The feedback is an amazing and wonderful thing to read, mainly from teachers and heads who've had either big, who've run big translates or who've had just one translator in schools, trained person, um, go in. And um, it's the sort of feedback that you, might, you might kind of make up yourself for your thunder if you uh, if you didn't have it um, there. It's really it's really amazing. And now that since I've been involved over the past few months, I've seen some of these workshops in action, and um, it is really an incredible experience. Um, I just wanted to give two examples to kind of um, support these these claims. One is a, a workshop that we did in a secondary school in Crewe um, in uh, in the summer, which was a Polish. Uh, translator who took year 10 students through tra uh, poetry translation and at the beginning it was an hour and a half session at the beginning there was a year 10 so a 15 year old boy sitting with his head on the table like this and uh, the some uh, uh, an educational consultant that we had observing the day um, went up to him and said uh, is everything okay and uh, he said I don't know why you want me to translate Polish, I can't even speak English in it or something like that. And uh, she kind of taught him a little bit and then just watched him um, in particular as things went on. And at the end of this, this an hour and a half, he stayed behind and asked the teacher and the translator if he could have some extra Polish poems to take home and translate. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, and and then on Tuesday we were in Sussex and with some ten year olds and um, and if anybody follows me on Twitter they'll already have seen this because this this is this was my take home from the day. But basically at the end of the day, it was also Polish because of our Polish spotlight. Um, a ten year old boy burst into tears because he'd lost his sheet of paper where he'd in pencil done his translation of this Polish poem, and um, every his mum was there she'd come to the performance at the end and everybody got very flustered and worried about how he was going to, you know, about how we were going to stop him crying and um, and somebody, I think it was his mum actually, picked up another piece of paper and said, was it this poem? As in, was it, is this a translation of the same poem? And he was like, yes. And she said, well, there you go, you know, that this is the same poem then. And he just cried even more, you know, because it's obviously like, no, this is, this is not my, that's not my creation. I did something really individual and it had obviously been such a special experience for him and, um, and thank goodness we did find his, uh, his, his, his translation on the table, and uh, and you know all smiles. And I just thought that was such such an interesting example of the power of this of this sort of work. And all of the kids, we got. I, I asked them at the beginning, you know, uh, do you think you can translate? Do you think you can translate out of Polish? None of them obviously knew any Polish, of course. They all said no. And that's that's one of the things that happens in these workshops is that the pupils go from an experience of. Um, disempowerment to empowerment um, and there's all sorts of space for making mistakes and for um, empathy because you're uh, uh, there's lots of kind of listening to others and being aware that there are different perspectives and um, that you might have a particular way of doing something but that's equally valid to the, the way that your neighbor is doing it but then you might have to work together to produce a collaborative version so um, uh, it's a, as I said, yeah, it's just a really powerful way of working with young people. Um, and did I have another slide? Okay. Yeah, and so um, creative translation in the classroom is the program that we're developing at the Stephen Spender Trust at the moment, which is um, about trying to make this practice sustainable. So not only training translators to do this work but also um, training teachers and producing resources, co-producing resources with teachers, um, so that they are properly usable by teachers in the classroom, so that, so that um, mainly MFL, modern foreign languages, and English teachers can do this kind of work. 
as part of integrate it into their classroom practice rather than it always having to be brought in from outside. And I think that's it. Yeah, and that's my question. Jenny, I guess would be a good um, okay. segue from that. Yes. Um, I feel very moved by what you were saying. <laughs> that was a, really, I think that's a really good way of actually following into what I'm going to talk about because, as you've heard, I'm working with Charlotte on setting up um, more creative work with translation. We're, um, we're in our first few weeks now of running what is the pilot year of the Oxford outreach, uh, the Oxford Translation Outreach Hub, and we're based at Queen's College in Oxford. Um, and our focus really is on outreach to schools and also the wider public, um, and it's outreach based on creative engagement with languages through literary translation, and that's going to be a lot of poetry and book prose as well. Is that nationwide, sorry? Mm -hmm. No, oh, at the moment, no. yeah, <laughs> I'm going to talk more about that at the moment, especially because it's our pilot year, it's, yeah. It's going to be <coughs> Oxford based. Um, so we come from, we both come from um, <coughs> language learning and teaching backgrounds. We've done research in, 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 in language and, and we've both done teaching of, of all kinds and um, share, I'm sure, um, a common concern about the uptake of languages in schools and universities and really this, this project comes, comes out of that. Um, and also a really um, sort of belief based on our experience that actually bringing literature into language learning can make it really fun and really exciting and, and creative. Um, we also both have the sense from having been involved in various <coughs> universities in various different ways that there's a lot of enthusiasm among students for, for translation and for, and for transmitting that enthusiasm. There's a lot happening in universities to do with translation, or at least there's more and more happening but not all of those resources are tapped, that some of the enthusiasm of the students isn't, isn't, isn't being tapped, and perhaps there isn't quite the audience of some of the things going on in universities that there could be. So we're hoping that this hub is going to use some of the students' energy and actually perhaps get more people to be able to engage with things that are already happening in the university. Um, we're doing various different sort of strands as part of this outreach hub. I think probably the most relevant today is are going to be our work with creating and running translation workshops in local schools. Um, and what we're going to do is, we're not going to run those translation workshops ourselves, we're going to train undergraduates and postgraduates to go into schools and deliver those workshops, which will be more or less literary in nature, using poetry, using prose. Poetry lends itself really well to that kind of format. It's short, you can get a completed result. It's very satisfying. Short stories work really well. Graphic novels work, work really well. Um, so we will help to train students, but we've also recruited people with very very specific experience in this kind of thing to come and train the students. We have Rahul Berry, who's currently the um, translator in residence at the British Library, to come and give the undergraduates some training, but he also has a background in teaching. Um, we also have um, Kitanjali Patel, who is um, part of a brilliant organisation called Shadow Heroes, who already do this kind of thing, that they go into schools and deliver a range of, of translation-based workshops um, and use them to, to develop critical thinking. So Rahul and Gitanjali are going to come um, and meet students, help them to develop their own workshops. The idea is that the students will, will um, deliver what is more or less their own material, but with a, with a framework that's been, they've been given some help with. Um, and as Charlotte briefly mentioned, these workshops aren't going to need the students to speak the language from which they're working. And the idea is that this makes it more inclusive, that as few of them as possible are starting off from the point of, well, I don't speak that language, so I'm going to to do this. They, they, they specifically don't need to speak the source language. Um, and what we're hoping, of course, is that this is going to lead them to exciting encounters with foreign languages and with literature and with translation that they might not otherwise have, but aren't necessarily on the curriculum, and that teachers can add to what they're already doing to, to inspire the, the pupils. And initially we're going to do this at pre-GCSE stage, pre-GCSE pre choice stage, obviously with the idea that you know, this much builds up some enthusiasm for more language GCSEs and more language A levels. Um, 
out of that, we're hoping that we'll, um, we'll be able to do some research. The plan is to bring together the results of some of, of some of what's done, so to get feedback from the people delivering and receiving the workshops and see what works in the classroom and see what doesn't, because there is a, there's a gap in um, sort of hard facts about what works and what doesn't. So we're going to, we, we're going to use, use the workshops to bring together information about that. We're going to have a symposium early, early in 2019, and we're hoping to bring together people who are already practicing in that field to share what they already know. Because again, the idea of this being a hub is that there is lots happening that isn't necessarily being shared. So we're going to, before we deliver the workshops, get some people together, share good practice, and feed that into what we're doing, and again, feed that into our research, which will be published on our, on our website for anyone who wants to, to see. Um, we're going to monitor the workshops, help the students deliver them, and um, yeah, good things will come out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Briefly also, we're going to support, as I mentioned briefly, things that are already happening at the university. There are international writers coming on a fairly regular basis to Oxford University, of course, and for example, there's a German writer coming this term, and we're just going to ask her, as part of her existing activities, to do a translation workshop. Um, for anybody, for mainly for students. Um, and again, just try to promote that so that more people go to these things, because sometimes you get these wonderful writers in and, and there'll be maybe five students. There's a lot happening in Oxford. You need to fight to get to get an audience for the, the things that are going on. And it's a shame that these things happen without many people benefiting from them. Um, and also, lastly, we're going to run a international literature book club, which we'll do once a term. And read a work in translation each time um, and the hope for that is that there will be students attending but we're really going to try and open it up to people outside the university as well. Um, it'll be Oxford based but um, the emphasis not being on the university, just anybody who wants to come along with international literature. Again, there's so much more, more, more being published in translation now, it's getting people to read it and share it and, and enjoy it in an exciting way. Um, for the future, we're hoping that this is this is um, at the moment an, an Oxford-based initiative. We're going to go into local state schools, but um, our idea is that we can develop a model which can then be transferred into other universities. So if we can develop resources for training undergraduates, it should be something which can um, then quite effectively be used by other universities to train their undergraduates to go to their local state schools. Um, and of course, we're hoping that the research that we come out with um, will just be able to help people to be effective in their delivery of translation workshops and, just, and get some good ideas of, of how to do it. Um, and create resources that schools can use directly. Also, as Charlotte was saying, um, it's really exciting to have a translator or a student come into your school, but it's also great if teachers can deliver some of that kind of material for themselves. And if, and if some of it's just there for them to take, it's a lot easier for them to incorporate that into their, their busy working lives. Um, I think that's what I've got to say. Did you want to find anything, Charlotte, no. to that? I need to I've got PowerPoint, I've said to myself the timer. So by the end of this talk you'll hear a loud ring tone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a very tense time for me because I did these slides in Google Slides, so we'll all find out if they transfer to a normal PowerPoint now. Okay, the time is on. Can everyone hear me? I have a very loud voice, but <laughs> which my family um, never stops reminding me about. But if you can't hear me, then please wave from the back. So I'm Theodora Danek. I manage the translation program at English Pen. I have the longest job title in history. My job is, title is Writers and Translation Program Manager. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do. We, um, we're a small charity. Um, based in Farrington in London. Um, our motto is freedom to write, freedom to read. Um, we were founded almost 100 years ago. Our motto um, in our charter is that literature knows no frontiers and that kind of um, feeds into everything that we do. So when I was preparing for this workshop, I thought, what do I do that is really innovative? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what, I, what I keep coming back to is that the most innovative thing that you could do for poetry and translation is paying people. Um, so, um, that is part of what I do. So we run the Pen Translates Award um, 
um, which is uh, pen translates um, helps to fund um, literature translation by supplementing or taking over some of the translation costs that publishers um, bear. That's how we make sure that translators get paid properly because we um, we only pay out this grant if publishers um, can assure us that they will pay um, the um, TA approved um, rate of Currently, it's ninety-five pounds for thousand words in prose, and another rate for translation. That shamefully, I can't remember. So um, every year, we um, we have about thirty-four titles that we um, that we give a grant to. There are always several poetry collections in there, and um, they um, they we've heard from poetry publishers in particular that they do really need the grant money because they wouldn't be able to pay their um, translators. Um, it still <coughs> happens that um, publishers publish poetry where the translator is doing it for free and that is something that we definitely do not want. Um, so um, this really helps in getting translations and poetry translations out there, which is good. There's currently a grant round open, so please send me your applications. The deadline is the 30th of November. Um, it is a long application form, but it is not as harrowing as some other applications. <laughs> <laughs> so that is one thing that we do. Um, um, a thing that is um, good about this, this grant, I mean, there are many things that are good about this grant, but a thing that is really good about this grant is that it really supports regional diversity and linguistic diversity. Um, what we know is that um, some countries have uh, funding institutions in place that can support your, um, your translation with their own funding. I mean, I'm from Austria, and Austria has money to give you if you really have a translation as burning a hole in your pocket, if you if you manage to fill out the ministry form correctly. Germany has that, France has that. I mean, they don't have unlimited money, but there is funding available. For other countries and other languages, that is not the case, and that's where Pen Translates really comes in. Um, we can pick up some of that slack, not all of it, but we can help. Um, the, the second thing that we do is, um, this is a very stark image, but the second thing that we do is um, is giving visibility to writers. So what we focus on, what Penn focuses on is, like I said, that literature knows no frontiers. We support UK writers, but we are really focused on um, international writers as well. Um, what we want to do with that is um, to give a sense that Write, good writing is writing, and that there should be solidarity among writers, especially to writers who are in prison, but also in general to writers who speak another language, that we basically are all trying to do a similar thing, getting the writing out there. So um, we've launched this online scene, the pen transmissions, with, which Rebecca mentioned, um, where we uh, features not, feature not only writers that we've supported, but um, also writers from really um, all parts of the world. This is our current front page. But I wanted to highlight um, a couple of poets that we've, um, we've supported in two strands of our work. work. Um, so this is Mavar Sabet, who's a poet that we work with and campaigned for for almost 10 years. Um, Mavash is, um, was, is a poet who was imprisoned in Iran for her, um, for her beliefs um, for almost a decade. She was um, released um, last year in 2017. Um, and um, she, um, my, my colleague Kat, who campaigns for Writers in Prison, campaigned for her for all this time. Um, and shortly before, uh, shortly before she was released, um, she was, oh no, that's my timer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, she was, um, I only had three more slides. Um, <laughs> Mavash was um, given um, a prize as a bright of courage by our annual Pen Pinter Prize winner, who was Michael Longley last year. So this is a prize that we have every year, where um, a, a amazing writer is, receives the Pinter Prize, but they share the prize with a bright of courage, who's a writer based somewhere else in the world. And last year, this prize was shared with Mavash. Um, so Mavash, in, when she was in prison, um, started writing this incredible poem, poetry which was focused on nature. And part of our campaigning was um, helping to translate her poetry and bringing her poetry to an international audience to show that this is a person, a poet who's imprisoned and who has a face and a and creativity and a real person who doesn't just get lost among all the other political um, or prisoners out there. This is a really, really 
incredibly important part of our campaigning. And what we were always looking for is people will help us translate or will proactively campaign for poets, especially and writers who are um, imprisoned. Marash is, this is Marash after she was released. So she was um, incredibly, um, she's an incredible person. We featured an interview with her on pen transmissions, which are really encourage you to check out because she's incredibly um, interesting and lucid about her poetical practice as well. Um, I've got a last thing. This is um, another super happy person. Um, and I want to give you a quick run through of what we can and we sometimes manage to do for for poets and translation. So this is Norman Eriksson Pastorigo, who is a poet from Indonesia. Um, Norman came to our attention because he was shortlisted for the Pen Presents Award, which was introduced by my predecessor in my role, which is Erica. Erica, please raise your hand. Hi. Yes. <laughs> so Erica is now the CEO of the Poetry Translation Center, but um, she introduced the Pen Presents um, Award, which um, was a way of bringing the attention of publishers to um, unpublished um, writers from different parts of the world. So the second round was um, East and Southeast Asia, and Norman's poetry collection was brought to attention by his translator, Tiffany Tsao. Um, as a result of, um, of being shortlisted, uh, his collection was picked up by Tilted Axis Press, and it's due to be published in 2019. Tilted Axis then applied to us for a grant, which they received. <laughs> and um, based on that, I asked um, Norman to write a personal essay um, for pen transmissions which was the essay that he said he always wanted to write but never had the opportunity to, which I kind of had a hunch of, which is why I asked him to write it, because Norman is a really amazing poet. There's some poetry of his already online, but as I said, look out for his collection. I can't wait to read it. So he has he does a number of things that I'm interested in. He's a queer poet, he's a Christian poet, he's from Indonesia from an ethnic minority in Indonesia. He writes in a way that resonates with me um, very much about being a queer Christian, um, which is very interesting. Um, so, and this, this, this being published on transmission kind of, he said, gave him the opportunity to really reflect on what he's doing in his poetry practice. So this is like, this is the ideal case for me. This is the best case scenario of doing things like that. Um, and this is kind of what we at Penn want to do. I don't know how innovative it is, but at least the money part, I think, hopefully helps. <laughs> um, yes, so this is all our information. Do support us. We're a small charity. We need all the support we can get. And that's it. So first of all, let's give everyone, everyone a round of applause. much that was so interesting hearing um, all of the different kind of um, points of points of entry into the practice and um, um, dissemination of poetry translations that you've been um, working with. It strikes me that the kind of the, the way that you've been innovating is to make poetry um, available and, and accessible in very different ways by creating spaces in which people can do the act of poetry translation and you know, as we know, we have space for things to unfold and to, to, to happen and they often don't happen, um, which is why, for example, creating translation studies courses has, you know, hugely expanded the discipline. Um, um, bringing people together so that they can collaborate and work together, um, but also reconceptualizing what translation is so people can be, you know, can get there in their mind, to think, so through inter, inter semiotic. Uh, translation or through sharing um, kids at school that it's not this big scary kind of edifice of a whole you know grammar system that they don't understand and then obviously money lubricates everything in, in capitalism and, and in the world and, and you know things can't really happen without that so I'm just going to ask you all one question and then I'm going to open it to the floor for 10 minutes um, so sort of speaking to that what I was just sort of saying um, if you could all talk about one um, aha uh, moment or um, that sort of has shaped your your practice in trying to, to do more with poetry and translation or talk about a person whose um, actions or practices have inspired you. Um, so I have to give you a moment to sort of have that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any, uh, yeah, 
I'll talk about it already, just yeah. to embarrass them. <laughs> um, you know, we've been hosting Writers in Residence for a, a number of years. This is the first year that we've been able to actually have Writers in Residence on, in Dragon Hall. Um, and I was just saying to Jong Rae on the way here that from our perspective, she's kind of almost like an ideal resident because, um, you know, she's come here, we, you know, select, she's selected on the basis of her own poetry, which happily is translated into English, and she has a, a volume that she'll be talking about later. But what um, we've really enjoyed about having her here is the fact that she's so interested to meet UK poets um, and has been doing lots of reading and meeting people and going to festivals and that kind of thing. And then um, translating poems into Korean so you know she'll meet a writer and the next day I'll check her Facebook page and there's you know she selected one of the poems and translated it just for fun but then into Korean and then put it on on Facebook um, you know we're hoping that um, she'll be inspired to kind of tr translate a whole volume of poetry by one of the poets that she meets and actually get it published in Korea but I think you know yeah I just wanted to sort of uh, talk a little bit, you know, about how uh, uh, the fact that she's here for three months as well, I think, makes a difference. So, you know, actually having poet people who are poetry, poets and translators in residence for a set amount of time is good. Go on now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually both of the things that you asked for in some ways. It was, um, I was at a conference in Dublin last summer. It was part of the Dublin uh, International Literature Festival, I think it's called, and hosted, this particular bit of it was hosted by Dublin um, Literary Translation Centre, or something like that, which is part one of the things that's inspired what Jenny and I are doing. They, they, they've got a really cool programme that includes a book club, um, and, um, and some members of the French literary group, I think that was translate how you pronounce it were, were there talking about um, what talking about their approaches to literature in the context of translation and um, and that really struck me and as I was cycling to the station this morning it suddenly came back to me and I thought damn I should have looked out those notes and then I could have talked about that today because I can't exactly remember the detail of what they were talking about but what really struck me was that because what they do is all about constrained writing which in some ways sounds like a really unpleasant thing, but it's actually a way of unlocking creativity by, you know, not using the letter E famously or um, <laughs> something like that. And, and, it, and it, it's, I, I've talked mainly about um, translation with primary pupils today, but actually um, what I'm particularly interested in the moment is at the moment is looking at what we can do with secondary pupils when things get, have to get a bit more complex. You can't just give them a poem and say, make this rhyme. I don't think anyway, um, you kind of have to do, do something a bit more challenging and I think that idea of constrained writing or of um, maybe not even that kind of specific but of asking them to, to, to transpose as well as to translate so they're kind of, they might be translating a poem out of, um, a, a, in, into a new, um, into like modern slang or into a dialect or um, where you put some sort of condition on what they're doing, which adds an extra element into the translation process. I think that's a, a, an interesting way of making it even more fun and creative and challenging for young people. And that's one of the things um, that I want to look at in, in, with the Stevens Venture Trust, but also in the work that we're going to do at, at Queen's. Um, I think, yes, but I, something that springs to mind for me is again, a sort of echo of things that have been said already, but what gives me the confidence that, um, the absolute confidence that if we can just get the practicalities of what we want to do set up is that it is going to work, mm. is that I've see, just seen it work so many times and in such a simple way and it always works. Translation workshops just always seem to go really well. Um, and the, the ones that I run are, they couldn't be simpler. I'm not the most innovative workshop runner. But there's, you know, still I think that I get a lot out of them. I think the people who come get a lot out of them. Every time I go to one, I get a lot out of them. But also, I was a secondary school teacher for a couple of years. And I taught English, actually. But I would do sort of translation-ish activities whereby the pupils would watch a short drama or 
looked at picture even, and then write a poem from it. And we get them to write poems in different styles as a kind of constraint. So, okay, you can write a poem in this Gothic style, or you can write a poem in this style. And it, I was an inexperienced and, for the most part, because of that, relatively inept secondary school teacher. But still, the, you know, I was going to say the boys. I shouldn't say it was always the boys. It was usually the boys who didn't want to do it. <laughs> Sometimes it was the girls as well. <laughs> even the ones at the back of the classroom hating it at the beginning. They would come up with really good poems by the end, and they would be the ones who would not let you end the lesson without them reading their poem out loud. <laughs> so that's true. That was, they really were desperate to, and if you didn't let them, they had to do it in the next lesson. It just it just works really well. There's, and um, whether it's just in that sort of English to English kind of translation or using their own languages, it, it's just inspiring. It really is. Um, yeah, I've got three very quickly, so I have to give a massive shout out to Maureen Freely and Sasha Dugdale because uh, I didn't study literary translation, but I did a one-week Arvin Foundation course. There was a kind of a scholarship, so I could do that for a week straight out of my MA, and through who they are as people, um, basically made me a literary translator in a week. Um, and I did a. a translation workshop at Newcastle Literary, Literature Festival and one of the f one bit of feedback I got after doing this one day workshop was it was so nice to meet a real human being that does literary translation mm -hmm. and I, th I, I think those things are connected in terms of being a relatable person so I think often I'm quite silly when I do things like this but it's because I, want, I don't want to be intimidating um, and yeah, doing uh, an event at the Austrian Cultural Forum where somebody who has nothing to do with translation or writing said, I now get what translation is, which is just like, you know, that's what you're aiming for. So I think, again, reiterating, it's all about empowering people and de demystifying the process, sometimes by being a real human being, because translation is very much a human practice that sometimes through academia may be or it being kind of maybe at more elite circles can seem quite terrifying. Um, I guess my aha uh, leapness, <laughs> my <laughs> <laughs> translating as I go, um, is um, just in my entire time of pen I've rethought translation, um, not just as a literary activity, which is what I grew up with, um, um, at home, but as an act of solidarity and as making something visible and, and um, bringing things into the world, um, or not into the world because they're already into the world, but to the attention of people who haven't paid attention for maybe not not even out of spite, but just because it wasn't there for them to see. So that's kind of what I'm looking to do in my work. I guess my own personal aha uh -huh moment was when I was doing my PhD on the German poet Barbara Köhler, um, who who challenged me to think about what translation was when she called Niemannsfrau, uh, nobody's wife or nobody's woman, um, a different kind of translation. And then I had to kind of intellectually investigate what she meant by that, because whilst the first three words might be a sort of relatively literal translation uh, of the Odyssey, it then proceeds, um, as I was actually just chatting about on Friday at Theodora's event, and um, to be a sort of uh, mad epic of 3,000 years of Western culture that brings in sort of everything from quantum physics to Alan Turing and Greta Garbo and much besides. Um, so I had to think about then what that meant sort of translating um, poetry from one conceptualization of the world into another one, um, sort of, I guess, a political form of translation from a way, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the China Mieville city and the city, the sort of a translation in perception in a way, and then and how that might transform a, form a literary text. Um, but also, to, to go to speak to the, um, the, poetry, the poetry project that I work on, if anyone's interested in talking about um, developing research projects that connect theorization of translation and translation studies, um, especially with regards to poetry, uh, through practice-based work uh, and scholarship as well, um, come and talk to um, our principal investigator, Francis Jones, after this. Who, uh, who wrote the bid, um, because I know some of you are thinking about developing uh, similarly uh, innovative uh, research projects that bridge public and academic. Uh, so I think that, he, you know, if you want to get some real insights into that, come and chat to me, uh, to Francis. Also, um, Bill Herbert, who's our co-investigator, and, and Fiona Sampson at Roehampton, with whom um, 
I co-organised uh, today. I think that's um, that's what we've got time for now. Um, so um, if you'd like to do a big round of applause for our speakers and then So we're galloping on. And it's my huge pleasure to introduce four amazing speakers for this panel. We wonder what to call this panel because it turned out to be a concatenation of people thinking particularly about European and Russian translation. Um, and then obviously Brexit raised its, its ugly head and we felt the best way to sort of form our thinking was to think about not only how lucky we are in Britain to have cultural organisations who do a lot of the supporting of um, cultural dialogue and work in translation, but how much we're going to rely on them and their goodwill after March, assuming the worst that is supposed to happen happens. Sorry to um, <coughs> pin my colours to the mast. Um, so I, I'm going to introduce my I hope I'm going to manage to do this in alphabetical order. Um, this may not be the order in which they speak. So to my right is Elaine Feinstein, who is a poet, a novelist, and biographer, I should add, as well as a translator. She was the first to translate a book of Marina Svetayeva's poetry mm. into English, and her versions have received many awards. In fact, her edition of Svetayeva was a New York Times book of the year. Um, and she is going to speak, as it were, on behalf of poets and translators on this panel, because next to her is Petra Feynman from the Austrian Cultural Forum. Petra is a program manager for music, theatre and literature at the Austrian Cultural Forum in London. But she's also a theatre and film director who graduated from the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama and went on to stage and direct innovative plays employing trailblazing techniques like body mapping and live visual interaction. She's worked with Oscar winner Virgil Widrich and Simon Stevens at the Royal Court. So, another practitioner. And next to her is Gabriella Mochan, who in my experience has long been an incredibly generous force for poetry in Britain and indeed for British poets in Romania as much as for Romanian poets and writers here. Gabriella received her PhD in philology from Babesh Bolia University in Cluj in Romania in 2013, where she served as a lecturer in English for special purposes between 2007 and 13. She <coughs> BA in English in Norwegian, which I didn't know, from the same university. Since 2013, Gabriella has been head of literature at the Romanian Culture Institute in London where she also manages the art, architecture, and design programs. And if you haven't been there to Belgrave Square, it's a stunning venue, and it's just absolutely the right spirit and the right size of venue for, for poetry in particular. And then, Oswinia Gileneskinia is the director of the Lithuanian Cultural Institute, and she works with literature. It forms a significant part of her activities. She takes a creative approach to promoting poetry and translation in particular. And I was particularly um, sort of excited by your relationship with BCLT in the Summer British Centre for Literary Translation at the Summer School. And I thought, and the Indeed the Aori Project, and I thought how great it would be to hear from you. So I'm very much hoping this panel is going to be very inspiring and sort of looking forward to not only fear, but towards possibilities. Um, could I perhaps ask you to speak in reverse alphabetical order? Would that be okay? <laughs> <laughs> Since you'll buy your pamphlet. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's my first <coughs> slides. Hello to everyone. Um, it's a, thank you for introducing me. It's a big honor for me to be on the stage and on the, on the panel among some vulnerable speakers. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm one from very few of us coming not from UK and not from London. So I'm coming from Vilnius. Um, that's why I'm a, like nervous and stressed to speak in my broken English, you know. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, I think um, 
mainly, maybe mainly because I'm here, because of our last year and uh, some recent year activities, this uh, translation from uh, Lithuanian and, uh, and we'll talk about other, our neighboring countries, like the about Baltic, Baltic literature translations and relationships to UK. So um, in, it's really um, a great pleasure to be present there, and I think that some of our activities are really visible if you have, uh, uh, if you came to the idea to invite me today for the summit. So, um, the topic of the panel, uh, this panel is quite, or quite a political one, translation after, after breakfast. But I decided to, to highlight more positive aspects uh, and more collaboration and uh, aspects as, as negative ones. So I called it making new friends. Mm. So um, Brexit was a real shock, a real shock for us uh, from the continent, or at least uh, for countries I joined the EU quite recently. Uh, I spent my childhood in dystopia, which I detested with my whole heart. And now I live in Utopia. So the Lithuanian author Marius Ivashkevichus explained shortly after the Brexit in his column for one of leading German medias, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, uh, why Brexit felt to him like a betrayal, why for people living under authoritarian regimes, Europe remains a beacon of hope, and why, despite the skeptics, the European idea will prevail. The writer explains enthusiasm for Europe coming from the former Soviet countries and tries to understand the skepticism of British people. Uh, the whole essay is available in English <coughs> in our office and uh, not made before to get it on your personal email the for publication so if someone is interested because it explains so much uh, the relation to Europe uh, from uh, countries like ours uh, came from the authoritarian uh, regime and it's uh, related or it's what in par brought in parallel to uh, love affair. <laughs> but you you were so, for so many years in love with Europe, an idea of Europe and the lover comes to to uh, to to, 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 to or to, it's, it comes out, it's a lover, the object of love. It's not so nice as you were used to seeing. So um, the newly endangered relationship with Europe brings in a paradoxical, in a paradoxical way, I would say, um, a new attitude to the neighbor from the continent. It would be too hard for me to say, uh, to summarize, but I feel now that uh, in actually the interest in collaboration in literature is growing, uh, and the relations are so kind, some kind of warming up, uh, some quite opposite attitude to isolation. That's now our feeling nowadays. That in recent years we feel more positive uh, reflections. Um, between uh, British, <coughs> British people working in literature and, and other hours uh, than isolation. Um, of course, we need a large enthusiasm and resources to support the collaborative way of thinking and acting. Bringing people together, making new friends, we can make up an interest on each other's literature. And it is proved by time and by doing that when you knock, the door opens. Um, the Baltic Countries Literature Initiatives in UK in 2018 and in previous years was provoked mainly by the London uh, Book Fair uh, Baltic, Baltic uh, Countries Market Focus Program. Um, moreover, <coughs> moreover, we have chosen the way of dialogue. Um, dialogue empowers a long term engagement. I think it's clever to invest uh, in long-term dialogue rather than show off or something very, very. So I mean dialogue, dialogue between publishers and institutions and uh, some, some pictures you see it's from visiting UK 
publishes and uh, represents books from UK institutions visiting Lithuania. It's a dialogue uh, between poets. Um, we had some programs at London Book Fair and in the National Poetry Library in partnership with British Council and National Poetry Library, as well as uh, participation in some kind of dialogue at uh, um, it's, it's the same from the, the, the events, but also in the European Poetry Festival, uh, its program was created by C.G. Fowler. So collaboration between the younger generation of poets, what brought so many uh, nice, uh, uh, not only show off results, but also deep friendship and, deep friendship and, and dialogue between translators. Um, in partnership with National Center for Writing Knowledge. Um, it's uh, for the first time in 2017, the Lithuanian language workshop was organized, and this year, Baltic <coughs> countries languages workshop. It's the aim um, of, of participation in these programs to cultivate future ambassadors of Lithuanian culture and literature to the UK. And, uh, and the result of, of of this activity is also it's resulted in some four of new newly publication new publications in UK. And I would I would love to to have a slide to show why the work. So but it's for the future I think we also need translations uh, in Lithuanian from British poetry so much and it's um, it's um, gap in this in the recently years so we have to continue all these activities to bring also British uh, new British poetry generation to Lithuania and um, I want to point out the newest initiative uh, of the Lithuanian Culture Institute and British Council it's a um, poetry translator workshop which will ha uh, happen next week in, in London bring two Lithuanian poets and two British poets together and uh, they will be sharing these po poems and uh, also with the audience, with the public on Friday at 12 October. So everyone is invited, the event is for free and you have just to register and get invited. So um, maybe it's, it's like uh, uh, just want to support the dialogue. The dialogue is most important, and we have to be more open to each other and uh, open the doors. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a great way to set the tone. Um, uh, Uh, again, Fiona, for the kind invite, and Rebecca as well for all your hard work to put this wonderful <coughs> time together. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, for today, I'm not going to keep you too long, uh, as our time is already short, but uh, I decided to make a rather practical uh, uh, presentation, uh, given the topic and given the many questions that uh, uh, occur uh, thinking exactly as you said Fiona in the beginning, uh, are these organizations like the Romanian Cultural Institute or the Austrian Cultural Forum or the Ukrainian uh, Institute as well and others uh, still going to support uh, this exchange uh, once uh, Brexit is in place. And um, I have chosen the words of Pablo Neruda uh, the, the famous Chilean poet uh, who said poetry is an act of peace and I strongly want to believe in this and I strongly want to believe that this is going to carry on uh, after Brexit, after anything else bad that uh, might occur. And uh, as far and as far as uh, the Romanian Cultural Institute is concerned, uh, all our programs, uh, all the programs uh, through which we tried to support poets and translators, 
until now are going to continue and we will uh, want to work uh, in the same way with Britain as we worked before Brexit. So we would not like to you know, say, okay, uh, you opted out, uh, we are not going to do any business with you. No, we, we would like to continue definitely. And I tried to, to highlight the main steps, the main support um, initiatives of the Romanian Cultural Institute. Um, the first three um, actually are, two, are three main programs of uh, our headquarters in Bucharest, the Romanian Cultural Institute in Bucharest. Uh, through the first program, which is called uh, TPS, Translation and Publication Support Program, the Romanian Cultural Institute uh, <coughs> supports the publication of uh, any sort of um, uh, authors, like uh, Romanian authors in English translation. So if an English publisher uh, goes to the Romanian Cultural Institute and says, okay, I want to translate and publish this particular author, then the Romanian Culture Institute is going to uh, cover uh, most of the expenses related to the publication and the translation. And I'm going to explain in, in more detail. Then we have the grants for professional translators, uh, also uh, translators in training residence programs. Mm -hmm. uh, both of these programs uh, are taking place in Bucharest, and I'm happy to say that we have uh, young translators that we are very proud of and we want to invest in at present, who is here with us today. Her name is Andrea Scridon, she's right there. And she has just uh, actually been selected for the Translators in Training Residence Program, so she's going to start in November. Uh, fingers crossed for you, Andrea. Um, when it comes to us here in London, uh, the main ways in which we try to support translators, collaborations between UK and Romania uh, are the launch events that we do. So every time a new book comes out, we organize a launch event. Uh, we are very happy to collaborate with various partners and to fund poetry events throughout uh, the UK and London. And we have a very recent example, actually a collaboration, that, a wonderful collaboration that we had with, with Fiona uh, back in spring um, at the Ladbury Poetry Festival where we had a Romanian um, event uh, with uh, three Romanian women poets, Ana Blandiana, Magda Kovnec and Sotana Christian, who uh, actually um, was a very successful one. Yes, and we were very happy to work with Fiona on that. <coughs> Uh, then we here in London organize uh, Romania's participation at the London Book Fair every year and through this we also try to provide a platform for Romanian publishers to come to the UK to meet uh, various uh, book people here in the UK and to uh, try to maybe uh, put aside some projects for the years to come and to publish again British authors in Romanian translation. And then uh, this last one, uh, the funding for translation, uh, UK, resi UK residence programs. This is my uh, aim at present, and the Romanian Cultural Institute in London's aim at present, uh, to invest more uh, because our <coughs> major problem, I think, is the lack of translators uh, of Romanian literature into English. This is one of the big problems that we have, so that is why we want to invest more in young translators and uh, for the future we are very interested in collaborating with the National Center for Writing that was actually mailing back and forth with Gates and we hope to make it happen next year so yes and very briefly uh, just uh, just some figures some rough figures for those that might be interested so the translation publication support program covers, as I said, translation costs that can be up to 100% and also uh, publication costs. Uh, if it's going to be both, uh, then it's going to be balanced between the two. Um, and the National Book Center takes care of all these uh, applications. So all the uh, materials that have to be sent, all the paperwork has to be sent to the National Book Center, but uh, myself here in London, uh, I'm in direct uh, contact with my colleagues, so any 
of course, such uh, proposals can come straight to me. Um, and then the grants that I was telling you about um, for professional translators and for younger translators, these are um, uh, yearly grants. Uh, there are about 10 grants a year, um, and they last. They can last between one and two months. And uh, in the case of a professional translator, the main condition is for the translator to already have a signed contract with a UK, let's say, publisher. And for the younger translators, they need to have a translation project in mind. So, uh, for instance, Andrea has decided to translate uh, The History of Transylvania, uh, <laughs> which is a book that was written by uh, our actual, the current president of the Romanian Academy. And uh, this is her project, so she received this, uh, this grant to um, make this uh, project uh, turn to fruition, come to fruition. So this is, this is about it. This is what we what we do, this is how we try to support translators, uh, poets, uh, publishers as well, and it's exactly the way we wish to continue. So do, do email me in case you are interested in any future collaborations. Thank, thank you so you. much, Gabriela. Thank you for so those words of those were encouragement. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> much density and excitement. Thank you so much. Petra. Um, hello to all of you and thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. I don't have a PowerPoint and I lost my notes in a summit I was before and that's what <laughs> I, found, I just found out. So I will freestyle a tiny bit. But <laughs> to continue from my colleagues, uh, we will support translation obviously since uh, we were mentioned several times today so we have a tradition in uh, supporting translation and not only poetry, tr translation, of um, prose as well as um, we had our translation prize to mention something that we're really proud of. Chen initiated it in 2017 and we are very grateful for that and we were able to take it forward because she had obviously got lost since she went to the British Library instead of I staying with us. <laughs> um, but we took it forward and now we have, we actually we're grateful we had five times more submissions than we had in the first year we have established uh, translators, we have emerging translators who are submitting their proposals. We are proud to give a prize in the meantime and pay a tiny reward for the translators. So this is one of our new pillars we want to put an emphasis on and this is going to continue, for example. Maybe we explore poetry as well. This is, uh, since I hear so much about how we could facilitate that. I think we could possibly introduce something like that as well. Since we have two countries, why not having three? So we are perfectly open to things like that. Um, we have um, NBG. We're supporting new books in German since a very long time. And this is one of uh, the other main pillars we build our translation and <coughs> our support on. Uh, unfortunately, we can't support um, translation itself, translations itself, but what we do is we launch uh, uh, books here. So if there is an author recently translated, we are happily providing our space and our support in launching the book, facilitating networking with publishers as well as with translators, with uh, anyone involved in being able to support. So that's what we do and what we will continue definitely. And we are very grateful that we uh, support poetry in the meantime, since Stephen Fowler, and you exactly. mentioned him, um, invented the European Poetry Festival, and we just panned out the date. So we agreed on the date. That's why I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, because I was planning the next year's program. We have so many literature events, so many translation, uh, translation events. So we have the poetry event. We have our illumination series with Stephen Fowler bringing together poets from the UK or artists, authors from the UK with uh, Austrian authors to create, uh, based on Austrian, Aust Austrian authors, pu the public possibly don't know, new ideas, new poems, new artworks, and to spread the word, uh, not just to our community, because we know each other sort of in the meantime. Uh, to get the word out to our audiences, to engage the audiences, because the audiences they are the, the readers, so they are important to be taken on board. And I think this is something where we can definitely help and we want to help and continue to help. And what we 
can help with as well. So send me emails, please. The forms. I, I think the Aurora, my pre predecessor, mentioned the forms. Oh my God, yes, it's very devastating sometimes to, uh, yeah, not being able to deal with the ministry language in all those forms. Ask us, we help. We help because the federal chancellor is skipped. They're, they're granting translations. So ask us, we help with how to um, approach them, how to approach what kind of grants. The New Books in German has an amazing list of grants from German to um, uh, English and the way around um, uh, translation grants. Um, but if there's a question about specific Austrian grants, just ask us because we are glad to help and facilitate and um, put you in contact with the right person. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things that I can provide to this panel, and I hope this gives a positive perspective to after Brexit <laughs> translation after Brexit as well. It does. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed, Petra. Elaine. Well, I have no great hopes myself of anything improving after Brexit, <laughs> but at least I can throw some light on what it was like before we joined the uh, European Union. Because I can remember the 50s. I started writing poetry in the 50s, and I started translating poetry in the 60s. And actually, I want to just say one thing which is relevant, you'll find, about the panel before this. I was really delighted with it because it completely reversed my sense. Perhaps I'm being a little over-sanguine here, because it was a rather specialized way of treating the subject. It reversed my sense that there was a huge prejudice against people who came to translation to offer the skills of a poet rather than that of a linguist. They all seem to acknowledge there was something to be gained by that. I've always felt so, and if we had longer, I would ex explain why I think so, more precisely. But I was pleased to find it so. Now, you may look back to the 50s and 60s as history, but it's not history to me. I remember very well the narrowness of it. The, the real dislike of abroad which tainted even really fine poets like Larkin, who made it a joke, but he meant it. And I am really afraid that that might come into this little island community again if we are cut off from Europe. The only thing that gives me any confidence at all that it won't happen even if we do leave, and I still have a sneaky hope that we might not, <laughs> but I suppose we are. The only reason I feel some confidence it might not is because it's very difficult to take something away from somebody that they've been enjoying. We've loved being able to go freely round Europe. We don't really like those damn borders, honestly. And it's just Possible. That will mean that because we like reading a wide range of poetry from all over the place, and we'll come to Russia in a minute, we won't want to give that up, and so we'll still need to look out for, hope for, people we don't know about who may be writing at this moment, you know, I don't know, Azerbaijan or anywhere else in the world, we'll still want translators to bring them to us. I hope that's how it works out. I should declare my own situation quite honestly. I'm not a great linguist. I've only worked from Russian. I've translated from French and Italian and German, actually, but never particularly well. They're all languages I have a little command of. Russian? Well, I can read the script. I could once read Chekhov, I can't now. It's not where I get my inspiration as a translator, and I bet that's true of a lot of poets, because translating poetry 
ought to be as much a passion as writing it in the first place. But if it's not, what you get is not really poetry at all. I feel that very strongly. Jimmy Brodsky violently disagrees. But the reason he disagrees is something quite important that he has wrong. The Russian poets often have wrong. He thinks you've got to make a poem that sounds like the original and has the same rhyming, stanzaic, and tonal structure. No, that's not possible. You can't really do that. You can't bring an inflected language like Russian into English because they have so many rhyming words, they don't have to distort their word order. And English is a language which depends on word order. So I feel very strongly that uh, he's wrong about that. Yes. Um, about Brexit and Russia, it won't make much difference, will it? We're slightly, slightly less hostile than we were in the 50s and 60s. Not much. But I think it'll still be possible to translate from the Russian. And actually, rather the other way around is also still possible. And that's more surprising, because whole, both Fiona and I had poems translated into Russian within the last few months by an actor. Very, very good translator. And in a good little <coughs> magazine, so they still exist. So I don't know what will happen. I hope we don't leave. But I have some hope that poetry and translated poetry will still somehow survive. Yeah. Thank you very much, Elaine.